What do you think about human cloning? Would you say that it's man playing God, putting himself in the place of the creator? And of the clone, would you say it's an image or a carbon copy? In Revelation 13, would you say that the beast might use this technology to bring forth his image and breathe life into it and cause the world to worship it? Do you know that there's problems with genetic cloning that causes the lifespan of the cloned thing to live half as long or to have genetic problems inherent in their own structure or genetic body? Or what do you think about genetic modifications? taking a human being and making them better, bigger, stronger, whatever, so that they would thrive in environments that are unique to them. And what of any of this has to do with the Azusa Street Revival? Maybe nothing, maybe everything. See, I think the Lord put a picture in my head when I was going to be doing this video, and I want to share it with you. You see, uh, sometimes in our pursuits to recreate something, which only God can create, we force it and we create a clone and this clone uh, is an ungodly thing and it, uh, it takes advantage of God's people. It creates denominations and it genetically modifies Christians to thrive in those denominations and there will never be unity as long as these man-made properties and man-made events exist. Now years go by and generations go by and we forget what God birthed, what he created. And all we see are the evil branches that have come from man-made attempts to clone and to genetically modify. And what's left is an evil in the world that looks like a prosperity monster eating up God's people, making merchandise of them, led by wandering stars. And we take this and we look at what it is today and we judge the original and we don't want to have anything to do with it. We take words like charismatics and we take words like Pentecostals and we write them off from our fellowship and our family because we deem them as evil simply because they don't limit God. This is wrong on both parts. We are disfellowshipped for our conservative having the Jezebel spirit or for whatever reason we have. There are fractures in every denomination by the thousands. Among the Pentecostals, the Presbyterians, the Lutherans, the Baptists, and the Methodists alone, there are 45,000 different denominations. Some are steeped in Calvinism. Some are separated by, some are unified by the five-point system. Whatever the reason for denominational indifferences, God knows. But it doesn't mean that we're separated in the body of Christ. Yet, we are genetically predisposed by our teachings to only operate in the confines of our own denomination, conference, or even congregation. Now, this isn't always a bad thing because we have to have a certain amount of control lest we run amok. But in the end, who is really in control? Is it not the Spirit of God that's in control of the church abroad? And do we not all belong to the same body? Now, I understand that there is a movement in the ecumenical community that is opposite of what God has brought sometimes. He brings the sword. And in times of revival, he brings both. And all of those denominational indifferences, they melt away because God is a consuming fire. When he draws near, none of that makes a difference. And I'm going back now in this episode to tell you about the Azuzu Street Revival, one of the greatest nation-impacting revivals in the history of the church. It was authentic and real, so ask God right now to help thou your unbelief and get ready to have your socks blown off by the stories and the miracles of the Azuzu Street Revival. In 
June of 1905, there stood a vigil of two men in a little Baptist church in Los Angeles praying day and night for revival. They were praying for revival because one of them, Pastor Joseph Smale, just returned from Wales, having been himself set on fire by the Welsh Revival of 1904. And he came back and he set the entire congregation on fire. In fact, Frank Bartleman, the second of these two men, decided to write a letter to Evan Roberts, which he did. In fact, he wrote three letters to Evan Roberts and he got four responses. Three of those responses were instructions on what they were supposed to do as a congregation in the midst of being asked to stop and shut down all revival meetings by the conference of the Baptist organization they belonged to. But because they had spent months in prayer and fasting and seeking the Lord's face on the area of revival, they could, they recognized that it was the commandments of men coming from the conference and they could not submit to it as they had to be obedient, fearfully obedient to the Lord. So the Lord used Evan Roberts' fourth and final letter to say, let revival come. And so uh, uh, Frank Bartleman and uh, Joseph Smale uh, went to a little place that used to be a Methodist church on Azuzu Street, and the rest is history. Revival came in a more powerful way than they could ever ask or imagine. Enter in William Seymour, the one-eyed black holiness preacher who used to spend five to eight hours a day in prayer. A man who used to cover his head with a box because he didn't want to be distracted from his mission that Christ had given him on a daily basis. A man so filled with God, some even most would proclaim that they had never met a man on earth more filled with God. Now couple this with a praying congregation and you have the cocktail of revival and revival came in a glorious way. The deaf were hearing, the blind were seeing, the mute was speaking. In fact, on more than one occasion, there were reports the fire trucks came because of the reports of the building being on fire. The building was engulfed in some sort of flame. Sometimes it was shooting 50 feet in every direction, in every direction, mingling with the sky like a dance in the night. And these were recorded events and you can look it up yourself. There was a mist that rose up from the ground sometimes during these glorious services. Well, William Seymour had a box on his head. In fact, the, the mist rose up and it would, the children would play hide and seek in it. And these children would report this and recount this when they were older. It so changed their lives and they smelt a floral smell in different areas of the building. And it so changed their lives that they were ministers to the end of their days, or at least certainly most of them. But don't take my word for it. I mean, why would you? I understand if you don't believe my accounts or my testimony because I wasn't there. I'm just recounting what I've read. I'm trying to encourage you with it. But what if I told you there were witnesses? In fact, there were two witnesses and I have audio of them and I'm gonna leave you with this before I end this video. And you could call them a liar if you want, but why would you? They are godly saints. One's a pastor and one woman had been healed You've got to hear this for yourself. Now, I think we should introduce immediately our friends because it's a rare honor to have these people here with us. They were there when it happened. And we think of this as the movement that was started without a man. Jesus is the one who brought this movement into existence. Would you introduce these friends? Yes, first, this is Miss Maddie Cummings, who was here at the beginning of the Azusa Street meeting as a young girl. And this is the Reverend Lawrence Cantley, who is pastor of a Church of God in Christ in uh, Pasadena, in Pasadena, California. He was here at this great revival, and they are the two only known survivors that I know of who were here at that time. Now, were both of you acquainted at that time? Were you children here in the revival? Yes, we were. You yeah. knew each other. What'd you call each other then? Uh, Lawrence. And Maddie. And Maddie. Yes. You played together. Son, yes. son Catholic. Son Catholic. And this son. was a, this was a Methodist church. 
This one was is. originally uh, African Methodist Church, and they built a new church on 8th and Town Avenue and rented this to Azusa Mission, and eventually Azusa bought it. Now you were, uh, wasn't it true that uh, both of you received tremendous healings here at this spot? Yes, I received healing. I was deaf, and I, God healed me, and now I can hear. How many years you know, ago? Oh, that's been around 70 years ago now. Somebody said healings don't last. Oh, they do. And sometimes I think I hear too much, but thank <laughs> God for hearing. <laughs> you mean you really were, were deaf? Deaf, yes. I couldn't go to school. You could not go to go school? school, no. And what about you? Well, I had what we called TB in those days, and tuberculosis, and it was a terrible experience. And I heard that uh, there was a place uptown called Azusa Mission where they prayed for people and they got well. And I asked my mother to bring me, and she eventually brought me. And through the laying on of hands and the prayer, God delivered me from that TB. And I have, know I'm delivered because of, not only because of the way I feel, but I have been examined by a lung specialist in World War I, and they said, nothing the matter with you, boy. Get out of here. Would you tell me how old you are? I'm 79 years old. Are last you really? November the 23rd, 1974. Hey, this is quite an exciting day to be alive, isn't it? Uh, Dr. Sign, what would you say this place looked like when the Holy Spirit began to fall? Well... I think these two could tell a lot more than I could because they were here. Well, you researched it, so I thought you might <laughs> Well, know. it was just a two-block street. Azusa Street is a very short street uh, near the city hall. It was in the downtown area. And Elder S William J. Seymour had come from Texas to hold a revival here in a Nazarene church. And there you have it, right from the mouth of witnesses. Now, let me ask you something. Does your faith accommodate such miraculous events? If not, don't you think it's time for an investigation? Just asking.